Good evening, everyone. I'm Erin Beveridge, a clinical researcher, and on behalf of Canon, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our second session of our online neurology days. So tonight is our second session following an acute stroke pathway. And this evening, the focus is on the use of imaging and stroke diagnostics. We're very fortunate this evening to have three brilliant speakers lined up who are ready to share their knowledge with you. In fact, our first speaker is not only going to share his expertise, he's also going to host and moderate the session. So you really are set for a great evening. So please allow me to introduce you to Dr. Grant Mayer. Dr. Mayer is a neuroradiologist and a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. His primary interest is in imaging of ischemic stroke. He's also investigating computational methods related to stroke severity assessment and response to treatment with both CT and MR imaging. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Radiologists and a member of the British, the Scottish and the European Society of Neuroradiologists. This evening, he's going to share his vast clinical expertise and discuss the basics of acquisition and interpretation in the imaging of acute stroke and how this impacts clinical decision making. And with that, I pass the reins for the evening to you, Dr. Mayer. Thank you, Erin, for the introduction and uh, thank you for, to Canon for inviting me to this event. OK, so my talk is entitled The Imaging for Acute Stroke, Basics of Acquisition and Interpretation. My topics for discussion today are as follows. I'm going to talk about the aims of first-line imaging in stroke. I'm going to compare CT versus MRI imaging in stroke. I'm going to look at some imaging, these imaging features and how to interpret them. And then finally, we're going to look at the impact of imaging on treatment decisions. Where possible, I will relate relevant imaging features to the European Stroke Organization or ESO guidelines. So first to the aims of first-line imaging in stroke. It is often said that stroke is a clinical diagnosis. So imaging is used to determine the underlying cause of stroke symptoms. All three of these patients may present to hospital in the same way. The problem is we cannot clinically differentiate ischemic stroke on the left from hemorrhagic stroke in the middle, from stroke mimics, in this case, tumor on the right. The treatment for each is very different and getting it wrong could be harmful, even fatal for the patient. Brain imaging needs to be available immediately, performed and interpreted rapidly so that appropriate treatment can be determined. In other words, we're trying to identify patients eligible for thrombolysis and or thrombectomy. Urgent brain imaging is required for all patients who present with symptoms of stroke. Time is brain. According to Jeff Saver, for every minute of an ischemic stroke, 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers are destroyed. These familiar graphics show us how the likelihood of benefit after both thrombolysis on the left and thrombectomy on the right drops with time elapsed after ischemic stroke onset. Note that the peripheral lines showing the 95% confidence intervals for treatment effect on the odds of a good outcome cross the line of no effect, the horizontal line, around five hours for thrombolysis on the left and around seven hours for thrombectomy on the right. Thus, the European stroke guidelines indicate that under normal circumstances and barring major exclusions, thrombolysis can be offered up to four and a half hours from stroke onset and thrombectomy up to six hours from stroke onset. Now we will consider the CT and MRI features of stroke and how to interpret them. Whole brain volumetric CT imaging takes only seconds to acquire, about the same length of time it takes to scroll through this image stack and can be viewed in any plane as you can see here. When we review CT features for ischemic stroke, we may see nothing in the very earliest stages. Up to one hour after stroke onset, there is usually only cytotoxic edema with no net shift in water volume and thus no visible change in brain on CT. Then over the next few hours with the development of ionic edema, there is a net gain in excess water causing a drop in the CT attenuation of brain and early swelling. These features can be subtle, but are best appreciated as a loss of gray-white matter differentiation, often seen as an apparent loss of cortex and or basal ganglia. Swelling is usually minimal. In case you haven't yet seen the early changes on this slide, here they are. Late ischemia on CT in comparison is usually easily visible with marked drop in tissue attenuation seen as darker areas and advanced swelling. These features are secondary to vasogenic edema, a more rapidly progressive state with large net water gains in the brain. 
This is an unfortunate case of what we call malignant MCA infarction, since without surgical intervention to release the pressure of swelling, the patient is likely to die. The hyperattenuating or hyperdense artery sign is a highly specific and moderately sensitive marker of arterial obstruction. If present, it is visible soon after onset and is more reliably identified than subtle brain changes. High specificity means that if the sign is present, we can be confident there is a true arterial obstruction, as demonstrated here with concurrent angiography. Moderate sensitivity means that if the sign is not present, present we cannot be confident whether there is an arterial obstruction. It's about 50-50, so half of all arterial obstructions found in CTA are not visible on CT in this way. Stroke caused by hemorrhage is usually more easily seen in the earliest stages. Note the dense or hyperattenuating blood on these images. There are three common non-traumatic causes of spontaneous bleeding into the brain. Uncontrolled hypertension, typically causing bleeding into the deeper structures of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, as in the top left image, or into the brainstem. And two, amyloid angiopathy, typically causing bleeding into the lobes of the brain with finger-like extensions of blood into the gyri and commonly extending into the CSF-filled sulci around the brain, as in the top right image. And three, when there is an underlying vascular abnormality, such as an arteriovenous malformation shown in the bottom row here, ruptured aneurysms can also be considered here. CT angiography, or CTA, is used in stroke to provide an unambiguous evidence of large artery obstruction, particularly for patients being considered for thrombectomy. In this context, CTA also provides a roadmap of the neck vessels used during thrombectomy to access the intracranial arterial blockage. Note that most CTA, as shown here, provides only a snapshot of the arteries for a single moment in time. Collateral circulation is better assessed using multi-phase CTA to appreciate delayed filling. MR brain imaging for stroke commonly includes these six standard sequences to identify ischemic brain changes, hemorrhage, and arterial obstruction. Since each imaging sequence must be acquired independently, the whole process can take over 10 minutes. Some centers use more focused stroke protocols to reduce time. On MRI, ischemia appears bright on T2-based sequences, as seen in the top row here. These appearances do not appear immediately. Like CT, they rely on a net water increase and only become visible after a few hours. Comparatively, DWI or diffusion weighted imaging and its ADC counterpart seen in the bottom row are sensitive for the cytotoxic edema, which is, if you remember, that very airless change that we see before there is any net gain in water. Therefore, DWI abnormalities are clearly visible in the first few minutes after ischemic stroke onset. Much like the dense artery sign on CT, MRI can also provide indirect evidence of arterial obstruction with the loss of normal arterial flow voids. This is possible since moving blood does not normally return any signal and appears black, whereas stationary blood clot re does return signal and looks more like other tissues. Note the lack of the left internal carotid artery flow void on the right side of this picture. This obstruction was then confirmed with MR angiography. Similarly, heme-sensitive MRI sequences, such as this SWI on the left, may clearly highlight arterial blood clots. MR angiography, or MRA, can be used like CDA to provide direct evidence of arterial obstruction, but is more sensitive to imaging artifacts, such as apparent occlusion if flow is actually reversed, in this case of subclavian steel on the left, sorry, wrong slide, and movement artifacts on the right pair of images if injectable contrast is, is used, is not used. So this is the subclavian steel case, and this is the uh, angio without contrast and with contrast in the same patient. Heme is slightly magnetic, so hemorrhage sensitive sequences on MRI will take advantage of this property to provide imaging which is highly sensitive for the presence of blood products. In addition to the large acute frontal lobe hemorrhage in this case, Note the many chronic microhemorrhages in the right side of the MR image in a patient with amyloid angiopathy that are not visible on CT. Therefore, MRI is especially useful for patients with stroke when we need to identify hyperacute changes that are not yet visible or are too small to be easily seen on CT, and when we wish to determine whether there are microhemorrhages to support a diagnosis of amyloid angiopathy. Here is a summary of the main differences between CT and MRI for the acute assessment of stroke. 
Reading this helped us understand why CT is predominantly used for first line imaging and stroke. It's cheap and regularly available in most hospitals worldwide, especially 24 seven. It's fast, which is better for confused or disorientated patients. Now we will consider the impact of these imaging features on treatment decisions for stroke using the best evidence we have from randomized control trials or RCTs. The next few slides include forest plots, which combine and summarize data between different trials or from subgroups within trials to explore the impact of various imaging features on the effectiveness of treatment. In all cases, data points to the right of the vertical line support the use of a given treatment. In other words, these analyses can help us to understand whether specific imaging features should be used to decide whether or not to treat patients. This forest plot includes a meta-analysis of four thrombolysis RCTs that measured the size of ischemic lesions using aspects. Note there is no difference in the overall effect, the diamonds, for patients with small ischemic lesions, that's aspects eight to 10, compared to those with larger lesions, aspects zero to seven, although the group with the larger lesions is slightly underpowered. These data suggest that all patients, regardless of lesion size as assessed using aspects, can benefit from treatment with intravenous alteplase. However, the lack of certainty for the group with larger lesions, which is replicated in similar analyses using greater than one third MCA territory involvement as the measure of extent, leads to a cautious recommendation from the ESO. The European Stroke Organization recommends considering IV alteplase for patients under four and a half hours from stroke onset with more extensive visible early ischemic lesions. Clinicians are encouraged to balance this against other imaging and clinical features in favor or against treatment, and therefore to treat only selected patients. For example, to include time since symptom onset, extent of white matter lesions, and pre-stroke disability in their considerations. Similarly, this forest plot includes a patient-level meta-analysis, i.e. all the data are combined into one data set of the seven Hermes thrombectomy RCTs. Again, we are comparing aspect subgroups. Notice that there is no significant difference between subgroups based on lesion size for thrombectomy. In other words, there is not strong evidence to support excluding thrombectomy on the basis of lesion size alone. However, the, sub the subgroup with the largest lesions is again underpowered. Note the wider confidence intervals for those with aspect zero to four. Here, the ESO recommends that patients with larger ischemic lesions and aspects less than six are recruited into a dedicated RCT, which will hopefully allow us to definitively answer the question. However, again, they concede that treatment may be considered on an individual basis after considering other variables such as age and time since stroke onset. In a similar analysis using data from one thrombolysis RCT to assess the potential impact of visible dense arteries on alteplase response, we see no significant difference in outcome between patients with and without a dense artery. Although again, we acknowledge that the subgroup with a dense artery is underpowered. Nevertheless, this approach is compatible with ESO guidelines, which states that there is no good evidence to avoid thrombolysis for patients with known arterial obstruction. The wake up trial was, a, was an RCT comparing IV alteplase versus control for patients who had an unknown time of symptom onset. They used a mismatch in the visibility of ischemic lesions on two different MRI sequences, DWI and FLAIR, as shown here, to determine eligibility, since this pattern of mismatch suggests that stroke onset is under four and a half hours. Remember that DWI is sensitive to the very early cytotoxic form of edema, whereas other two T2 sequences like FLAIR are not. The wake-up trials struggled to recruit patients since many did not have the required imaging mismatch and had to be stopped early due to limits on funding. Nevertheless, the researchers were able to identify a significant difference in three-month outcome favoring IV alteplase. In other words, for patients who wake with symptoms of ischemic stroke or otherwise have an unknown time of symptom onset, the presence of a diffusion flare mismatch on MRI can be used to determine eligibility for alteplase. Thus, ESO recommends IV alteplase in this context. So just to round up, my conclusions are, CT is widely used for the rapid first line imaging of stroke, where it is really important to minimize delays. We should add CTA if thrombectomy is available. MRI is best for problem solving. And finally, there is limited randomized control trial evidence that imaging features of ischemia at baseline should be used to deny patients treatments for stroke. Thank you for listening.
So it's down to me now just to uh, bring on uh, our colleagues for the evening. So our next speaker for this evening is Dr. Anton Mayer, spelled differently from myself. He's a radiologist from Nimegen in the Netherlands, um, and he works at the Radboud University. He specializes in neuro, head and neck, and emergency radiology, and he partic participates in both clinical and research projects in imaging neurovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. His presentation for this evening is state-of-the-art brain CT perfusion in acute ischemic stroke. Thank you, Dr. Mayer, for this uh, kind introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting me to discuss brain CT perfusion imaging in acute ischemic stroke. My name is uh, Anton Meyer. I am a neuroradiologist at the Rabaut University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. And I have to disclose that at our department, we use uh, Canon CT scanners for, uh, for performing acute stroke imaging. In this presentation, I will discuss uh, the clinical application and the concept of brain CT perfusion. Next, I will discuss uh, the deconvolution-based uh, CT perfusion algorithm versus the Bayesian CT perfusion. And in the last part, I, did, I will discuss some exciting new developments in brain CT perfusion. Brain CT perfusion is used for the detection of a brain perfusion deficit in the brain, which uh, can confirm the clinical diagnosis, the clinical suspicion of an acute ischemic stroke. But it can also identify a stroke mimicker, uh, a patient suffering from a seizure, or an underlying vascular malformation. Brain CT perfusion can also aid in the detection of intracranial vessel occlusions, which can be relevant for the treatment of the patient. And CT perfusion is mandatory in the selection of patients in the extended window, uh, based on the volumes of the penumbra and infarcto areas, patients can be selected for intravenous thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy. And in general, CT perfusion is a useful add-on tool which makes life easier in the diagnostic workup of ischemic stroke. This is illustrated by this patient. This was a patient presenting with acute onset of aphasia. Uh, on non-contrast CT, hardly any abnormalities are seen, uh, but on CT perfusion, a Perfusion deficit is easy, easily recognized in the middle cerebral artery territory on the left side. And when you identify such a brain perfusion deficit, it is it's good to, it is advised to go back to the CT angiography because small vessel occlusions can be detected, which uh, could be overlooked in the initial evaluation of the CT angiography. So it can aid in the detection of intracranial vessel occlusions. This is a patient coming in with acute neurologic deficit on the right side, and on brain CT perfusion, uh, an asymmetry is seen in the left cerebral uh, uh, hemisphere. But this pattern of the CT perfusion is atypical of acute ischemic stroke because uh, there is a, a pattern of hyperemia with an increase in the cerebral blood flow and an increase in the cerebral blood volume. And when looking at the 4D uh, CTA rendering of the CT perfusion acquisition, an abnormal early enhancing cortical vein is easily uh, seen. And this was a patient who had an arterial venous fistula presenting as a stroke mimicker. CT perfusion can be of aid in the diagnostic workup, but of course do not forget the importance of the non-contrast CT because early ischemia, but also intracranial vessel occlusions can be detected on the brain, on the non-contrast brain CT. Brain CT perfusion is a dynamic acquisition over time, uh, where the passage of a contrast bolus through the vessels and through the brain parenchyma is evaluated. The quality of the acquisition, the dynamic acquisition depends on the patient, the patient, of course, has to lie still for, for the time of, during the acquisition, but it is also dependent on the cardiac output and pathology in the brain. Uh, 
Brain CT perfusion acquisition is also dependent on the experience of the technician, but overall it is, it is not a difficult procedure to perform. It is advised to uh, at least uh, perform an acquisition of 70 seconds. In the, early, in the first phase of the acquisition, the temporal resolution should be higher than in the, in the second half of the acquisition. And depending on the CT scanner you have at your department available, the coverage can be the whole brain or limited coverage. Based on the dynamic acquisition, the time density curves of the vessels and the brain parenchyma are ca uh, calculated. The upslope of the curve represents the cerebral blood flow. The time uh, of the passage of the bolus, contrast bolus, represents the mean transit time. The area under the curve represents the cerebral blood volume. And the peak of the curve uh, represents the time to peak. And when Evaluating the quality of the CT perfusion acquisition is good to look at the curve of both the artery and the veins. And the artery uh, enhancement is uh, represented in a red line, and the venous uh, enhancement is represented in the blue line. Of course, the arterial phase is earlier than the venous phase, and in general, the density of the veins are higher than the, uh, than the arteries. Based on the dynamic acquisition, uh, uh, the CT perfusion uh, algorithm um, uh, generates the CT perfusion maps. And nowadays, the deconvolution based methods are default. For example, the singular failure decomposition. These deconvolution algorithms, they are delay insensitive and correct for dispersion. This is of relevance because uh, delay and dispersion give an underestimation of the cerebral blood flow and an overestimation of the mean transit time. That is, uh, uh, for example, of relevance when there is a cervical carotid artery occlusion, which, give a which gives a delay of the contrast enhancement of the intracranial vessels. So in order to have an adequate evaluation of the brain perfusion, it should correct for delay and dispersion. And based on the CT perfusion algorithms, the column maps uh, are created. In this patient, there is a left side deficit, and it is easy. An easy way to look at the perfusion maps is to look, first look at the time to peak to identify that there is an asymmetry, then look at the mean transit time and cerebral blood flow maps. And uh, in order to identify a, a true perfusion deficit, there should be an, a correlation between the mean transit time and the uh, cerebral blood volume, blood flow maps. The blood, cerebral blood volumes are used for the differentiation between the infarct core and the penumbra areas, although some perfusion algorithms uh, perform a thresholding on the cerebral blood flow. And in this case, there is a summary map created with an area of infarct core denoted in red and uh, surrounding a penumbra denoted in yellow, which corresponds well with MR diffusion imaging. So brain CT perfusion is used to identify a brain perfusion deficit and to estimate tissue viability. And this depends, this is highly dependent on the collateral status of the patient. But it is also good to realize that perfusion thresholds are time dependent, that perfusion thresholds do not reflect metabolic, metabolic activity of the brain, and brain perfusion thresholds may differ between parts of the brain. For example, that it is different for white and gray matter. A new perfusion algorithm which is now available is the so-called Bayesian perfusion. Bayesian perfusion is a probabilistic estimation of the perfusion values and is also delay insensitive. Bayesian methods are less sensitive to noise and enhance the diagnostic reliability liability of ischemic stroke detection. And the Bayesian method can be uh, combined with prior noise suppression of the acquisition. For example, the application of a 4D similarity filter in order to uh, further reduce, reduce the noise in the images. This is illustrated by this case. In the upper row, there is the default uh, 
um, deconvolution method, the singular value decomposition, and in the lower row, there is the Bayesian CT perfusion. In this case, there is a left side perfusion deficit in the brain, which is more easily identified on the perfusion maps because there is less noise and an impro improved demarcation of the, of the affected area. Here, seen in the cerebral blood uh, flow and the mean transit time maps. And this perfusion deficit correlates well with the uh, MR diffusion imaging. Another case, patient with the left side thalamic perfusion deficit, which is more easily identified on the Bayesian perfusion maps because of a reduction in image noise. And this again corresponds well with the uh, brain diffusion imaging. And in a larger data set uh, in, at our site, we have uh, um, uh, indeed demonstrated that the overall image quality of the perfusion maps is higher, is judged higher for the Bayesian CT perfusion in comparison to the singular value decomposition. Image noise in the CT perfusion maps can be further reduced when applying deep learning image reconstruction uh, prior to the Bayesian perfusion algorithm. And this is illustrated in this case with superior quality of the image maps. When selecting patients for therapy in extended window, uh, this is done by uh, estimating the volumes of the infarcore and the penumbra areas, as has been demonstrated in the Dawn and Diffuse studies. In those clinical studies, the rapid software algorithm was uh, the default uh, method of the perfusion processing, but it has been shown that Bayesian CT perfusion is non-inferior for estimating the infarcore and penumbra areas. But it is important to officially inspect the summary maps uh, for errors. For example, in this case, CFS spaces were incorrectly denoted as infarcore areas, as was a small area of tissue loss in the brain. So it is important to identify these errors which can be easily, easily corrected on a workstation. In the last part of the presentation, I will discuss some developments on CT perfusion. Um, one really important uh, development is that CT perfusion is really integrated in the uh, workflow by an automated processing, so a zero-click solution. This saves time and um, uh, for the diagnosis, but it can also be combined with AI support for the detection of pathology. So the perfusion deficits can be automatically detected and tissue viability estimation is readily presented to the reader. It can also be combined with uh, automated detection of hemorrhage on non contrast CT, uh, the identification of early ischemia, but also the uh, detection of intracranial vessel occlusions on CTA and the evaluation of the collateral stratus. These developments are taking place now and different packages are available for uh, application in clinical practice. And this integrated workflow aids radiologists and clinician for making a both a fast and accurate diagnosis, which is really important in, acute, uh, in the diagnosis of acute ischemia. In order to further uh, reduce uh, the radiation dose and save contrast agent, but also to save time, the CT perfusion can be combined with the next CTA acquisition. So this is one acquisition where one uh, time point of the CT perfusion is substituted with a, uh, a CT volumetric CTA acquisition of the neck by rapid table movement. Uh, also, and that has been uh, investigated at a group of our on our department, is that uh, a virtual non-contrast CT can be reconstructed from the uh, CT perfusion acquisition, which is shown on the left side. Something which is already uh, available is uh, the so-called timing invariant CTA reconstruction from the uh, CT perfusion. This is a superior quality CTA uh, of the brain. Uh, and therefore then a separate CTA acquisition is not necessary. Finally, um, uh, which is something uh, under debate and study, clinical study now, is that the CT 
uh, acquisition is combined with the CTA of the heart in order uh, for the detection of, embo uh, of an embolic source, uh, but also possibility for screening of concurrent coronary artery disease. This is something where the cost effectiveness still needs to be determined. And it has also been debated whether it should be a non-ECG gated helical acquisition or that a separate prospective ECG gated volumetric acquisition of the heart is necessary. Um, this, is a, this is a topic of current research at different centers. With that, I would like to summarize and, and uh, stress that brain CT perfusion makes life easier in the diagnostic workup of stroke because it aids to make both a fast and accurate diagnosis. Brain CT perfusion can be easily integrated in the clinical workflow and automated processing of both CT perfusion, but also the non contrast CT and CTA um, uh, is of added value and will uh, a aid uh, to improve the outcome of the patient. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Maher, for an excellent talk. We're going to move now to our third and final speaker for the evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joseph Pugh. He's a radiologist and researcher based in University Hospital, Dr. Joseph Trueta and Centre of Comparative Medicine and Bioimaging of Catalonia. He's based in Girona in Spain, and his talk this evening is entitled Diffusion Tensor Imaging as a Biomarker for Stroke Patients. Over to you, Dr. Pugh. Thanks so much, Grant, uh, to introduce me, and big thanks to the Canon team for uh, the organization of these fabulous webinars. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few minutes about the Diffusion Tensor Imaging as a biomarker for stroke patients and try to convince all of you to introduce if possible. So DDI is in fact uh, an important field in a stroke. Look at this graph. We can see that every year we have, we can detect more than 100 publications in PubMed. So it reflects an intense activity of the DDI in the stroke field. So the main keywords that I will try to explain is related about the anisotropy properties of the white matter tissue, the DTI metrics. We explain some fields about uh, the tractography, the role of the corticospinal tract in the motor outcome, the, this specific anatomical area very important uh, for the, 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 motor, the motor outcome, that's the posterior rim of internal capsule. We'll try to put some attention in the specific DTI pronostics biomarkers. This is the index of this talk. So the main, the main keyword probably the tail starts with the anisotropy. What is anisotropy? Probably you know what is the anisotropy. The anisotropy is the preference that the water molecules diffuse along to the axons. So um, the white matter tissue is anisotropic because the, the, the main direction of the water molecules uh, are along the axis of the axon. Uh, is, uh, conversely, the, 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 um, the liquid in the ventricles have the anisotropic uh, environment. So thanks to this, this uh, property of the white matter tax, we can calculate, thanks to the DTI, we can calculate specific uh, anisotropic indexes to provide information about the brain microstructure. So this uh, uh, is a scheme about the, um, the diffusion tensor in sequence is mainly, um, is mainly focusing two strong magnetic fields uh, of pools that generate uh, this kind of uh, images. So what kind of, of information we can obtain about the DTI? We can obtain different, different models. The first one is the microstructural model. We can detect information at the voxel level. And the next, the next model is the macrostructural um, in terms of the tractography. Try to merge all this information voxel by voxel in order to reconstruct the main white matter tracks. In this case, we can illustrate the cortico, corticospinal tract. 
that regulates the, the, the motor function in, in our arms and legs. So we will, we will see the importance of these of these uh, wet matter traps. And the ATI is a, a mathematic model, uh, three per three uh, matrix, and uh, we need at least six directions to give information at a specific voxel. Three directions is, is the minimum. If you, if you obtain more diffusivities, more directions in, in, this, in this voxel, the, anisot the anisotropy will be better explained and assessed, but the minimum is um, six. The, the eigenvalues and the um, eigenvectors and eigenvalues are the basis to calculate the fractional isotropy that measures, this index measures the degree of anisotropy and measures indirectly the tissue organization. This is the main, the main DTI metrics uh, used in, in clinical and uh, published in, in, in the bibliography, fractional isotropy. Another important um, other, other thing, sorry, is that fractional isotropy will have units, is a, a dimensional, ranges from zero to one. One could be the, the ideal maximum isotopy. Corpus callosum is, is around 0 0.75 or 0 0.8 uh, of anisotropy. It's the, 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 the highest anisotropy structure in the, in the brain, the human brain. The mean diffusivity is another, um, it's another parameter that measures the magnitude of, of the water diffusion across all directions. It's equivalent to the EDC that we can calculate in our clinical diffusion when we apply a protocol in, in, in the clinical scenarios over three orthogonal directions. This is a, an illustration try to explain better this concept in this kind of river. We can see um, a higher mean diffusivity, try to represent a higher magnitude where the water molecules can diffuse in this environment, but the fractional uncertainty, the directionality probably is lower than this second example where we see a higher fractional isotopy represented with this flow, directional flow in, in, a, in a shorter uh, uh, area. Uh, this concept could be explained a higher uh, fractional isotopy. And in another case, um, we see higher directionality, higher anisotropy, and higher mean diffusivity. This could explain um, graphically these concepts. Another, another issue that probably you are perfectly clear is how we represent in a color map the fractional isotopy. The main white matter tracks, here the corpus callosum, the corticospinal tract in this axial image of the brain, or um, this other, uh, this, this fascicle, uh, the longitudinal superior uh, fascicle, we can, we can see that these kind of white matter tracks are, represent a different color. The, the tracks where the fibers run to the left to the right are internationally represented in red, if the fibers go from the up to, to, the, to, the, to the lower, it's represented in, in blue, and fibers that run uh, anteriorly to posteriorly are um, depicted in, in green. So this is an international, an international um, uh, convenium, and the brightness is proportional to the degree of the fractional isotopy. Look at here, the genome of the corpus, the, the genome of the corpus callosum or splenium, it has a, a, a intensity of, of this high intensity of the color in the same way to the posterior rim of the internal capsule. So, what about the tetrography? Shortly, we'll see that the three dimensional way to represent the tetrography, the, the white matter tracks, could be the tetrography. The tetrography represents the main and it's uh, instead of the uh, uh, properties, um, it does not represent individually and specifically axons, obviously, but we have a big picture of the uh, fibers in, in the brain of the patient. So there are different, there are different uh, phases into the process to reconstruct the tractography. We initiate, put, uh, put in, 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 the, in the image different seeds. There is 
uh, different kinds of models to propagate this fever tracking. The two main models are the, 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 the deterministic and the probabilistic one. Probabilistic is better, but um, we need more uh, diffusivities, more directions to, to represent the model. So um, finally, we terminate using different thresholds. We terminate the tractogram and we finally can depict the, this tractogram and we can calculate the number of tracks, the track volume, different index like fractional isotopy, axial diffusivity, or radial diffusivity of a specific tracks or to the whole, the whole uh, tractogram. So the protocol that uh, we use clinically in, in, in Girona is um, we put the patients in, in our uh, magnet, 1.5 Tesla, and we take around three minutes to obtain 15 directions. That is a good number, it's, it's a lower number of directions, but it's, it's enough to um, study the, and to quantify the isotropy and to study the tractogram and the relationship with the infrarelation. So, if you want to increase the accuracy to study the mesotropy, you will put more time into the protocol. The protocol will be longer. So um, you, you need to increase these directions to have more resolution. But have in mind that at least you need six directions. And our protocol, for instance, we have dozens of publications um, with uh, 15 uh, directions. So it's perfectly we can we can implement perfectly the protocol into the into the um, into the stroke setting. So um, what are the the main the main probably the main pull list and the main uh, relevant uh, track um, from clinical point of view? Most probably is the corticospinal track. This uh, this track. Uh, regulates the voluntary movements of, of the extremities, the upper and the lower extremities. And the motor deficit is one of the main um, problems in, in, in the stroke, the stroke patients. So we can study several tracks, but we um, mainly will put attention to this projection fiber that is the corticospinal tract. So if you want more information about uh, the correlation between different atlas and uh, DTI images, you can you can take this this nice paper published few few years back uh, by Jellison. So you can you can have all the details um, about about this this role. So why why we need to include DTI if possible in the in the clinical protocols when we are studying stroke patients? The first one is to improve the diagnosis, to infer about the functional outcome. Now we will see some examples. And uh, try to put a special role as a biomarker for a stroke. Let's see why. So this, this, is, um, this publication um, was done several uh, years ago um, before the area of the mechanical thrombectomy. So we studied. Um, we study, uh, try to, to decide if DTI provides more information when we treat the patients before four and a half hour or after. So you have to, you have to, to be clear that the fractional isotopy is this yellow line. Fractional isotopy increase in values during the first 24 hours, more or less. So in inverse, if you, if you uh, drown a, a ROI in the stroke site and the same in the contralateral site then make the ratio, you can see that uh, in cases with, um, with uh, early strokes, when the stroke is in the few hours, you can see, look at here, the brightness, you can see the higher isotropy in this, in this uh, track. So conversely, if the infarct is older, older means, uh, probably uh, 12 hours or less than 24 hours, you can see that this fractional isotropy decreases in values. So, but as, as um, Dr. Meyer explained in the, first talk, in the first talk, we decide to treat or not using mainly the CT. 
not DDI or MRI. We can use MRI in, in few cases, but the tool, the key tool is the uh, CT. So this is more, is more interesting. How DDI can be a surrogate marker of axonal damage. We have explained the motor deficit is one of the main, is one of the main deficits in the stroke patients. So the first application I recommend to, to, um, to put attention is uh, try to analyze, to quantify the misotropy in, in, um, in the case of to detect and quantify the widen degeneration. We can see this infert in the deep territory of the and this uh, left MCA before the 12 hours. So the fractional insotropy in the corticospinal tract when it's crossing the, the, um, the, the stem, you can see no difference. The ratio is the same. The fractional insotropy is the same in the, in the left than in the right side. But at day 30, the, you can see that the fractional insotropy here in the right, in the contralateral side of the stroke is higher and it's decreased, the, the value is lower in the ipsilateral. lateral. So the ratio decrease. This, the, this um, decreasement, this decrease in, in, in this ratio is correlated with the, the stroke severity. Patients with, with a higher deficit, uh, motor deficit in, in upper and, and lower extremities. So using DTI, you can quantify the, the water and degeneration that correlates with motor deficit at day third. So another, another, um, another paper that we published um, was related with the same idea, but now we correlate these decreased values at day 30 and with the clinical deficit at two years follow up. So the quantification of the wallet, the wallet and degeneration at, at month correlate with a worse motor outcome at two years follow up. So DDI could be a good prognostic of motor deficit. And this is very important, this is very important to try to, and easy, it's pretty easy, to reconstruct the, the tractography when you are looking the patient into the machine. You can do this in the, during the examination because it's really easy. Try to reconstruct the corticospinal tract and overlap the diffusion sequence in order to see if there is and a lesion load if the infarct interacts is within the, the corticospinal tract. In this case, you see a large, moderate, large infarct, but the corticospinal tract is preserved. This is the opposite case. The, you can see here a small, just nine millimeters, a small uh, acute lesion. You can see here, it's very initial, it's very early stroke but there is a difference. You can see here slight hyper intensity in this diffusion weighted imaging, but the, the lesion involves the corticospinal tract. This patient, you can see here before the 12 hours that this patient will have most probably a worst outcome at, at month or at um, three month follow-up. Another example is in hemorrhagic stroke. In hemorrhagic parenchymal, in this hyperintense patient, you can see here one patient, one patient with the lesion. They have a similar, similar NEH and motor NEH, but um, this is a bit higher than this. But um, in this case, you can see that hemorrhage is inside the corticospinal tract is inside the hemorrhage, and in this case, in the hyperacute stage you can see that there is a motor deficit, but probably due to the compression of this hemorrhage. This patient, both patients have deficit in acute stage, but this one, we can say that most probably will have a worse motor outcome than this one, because the lesion involves the corticospinal tract, different in this case. So the two prognostic biomarkers you can clinically consider for stroke patients is the the corticospinal tract lesion low if the corticospinal tract, I repeat again and again, is inside the lesion or not, 
and the fractional stratified remote to the infrared in order to quantify the uh, water and degeneration component. So this is a, a revision that we published uh, two or three years back. Um, if you want, you can read in order to better uh, understand these concepts that I try to, to explain here. So this is another important slide. Uh, it's a bit frustrating for, for radiologists, but when you, when you see a patient, when you see a patient uh, one day or three days, not just in the hyperacute or acute stage, but um, over uh, 24 hours or three days, it's very important the stroke severity, the stroke severity, the motor score of any age is very important because this explain the 30% more or less of variance of the outcome. As a radiologist, using these techniques, we have more or less 30% uh, or 40% to improve this accuracy. The stroke severity is very important. Other issue is in acute stage when you have the penumbra, if the penumbra is re reversal or not, because the vessel recognized or not, this is another kind of issue. But in this scenario, it's more difficult to provide TTI in the protocol, in the imaging protocol, uh, because uh, time is brain and we don't have this range of time to, uh, to study the structural connectivity. So the next is not just put attention to DTI, if not we have to incorporate, if possible, the functional connectivity. In, in the recent data that we are trying to publish in these weeks, we are seeing that probably the functional connectivity could provide better information and could improve, improve better the motor outcome or the, 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 the ranking, the ranking of the, of the patients better than DTI. But if we can merge both, uh, both uh, technologies, the improvement of the, 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 the outcome could be better. So um, this was uh, my, my speak. Thank you, Dr. Puch, for your wonderful talk. We've received quite a few questions. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, possibly not. Um, and I'll try and find ones that are maybe directed more to individuals. Um, I mean, there's one here that's probably directed to my talk, which is um, how early and for how late do they, does infarct show on DWI, on a flare? Well, that boils down to the type of edema that we're dealing with. When you have cytotoxic edema, there's no net water increase. This happens within minutes, and that's detectable on DWI. The changes that you see on CT take hours to appear because they rely on a net increase in water into the tissue. Vasogenic edema or ionic edema first, then vasogenic edema. Um, and that's similar for sequences like flare. So the difference is a few minutes for um, on DWI and several hours on other T2-based uh, MRI sequences and on CT. That's the sort of simple answer to that question, although it isn't a simple thing to talk about. Um, I have another question here, which is about the, I think this is probably for Dr. Meyer, wondering about the, the best time slot to assess patients in the emergency department using CT perfusion. I'm wondering if they're referring to the windows where it's appropriate to use CT perfusion or when we should be using CT perfusion to help with decision making, Dr. Meyer. Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, I think it is a little bit dependent on the uh, the experience uh, because uh, uh, there is no one straight answer for that. Um, uh, of course, in the extended window, when the patients come in after six hours uh, of onset of symptoms, then you have to do uh, advanced imaging in order to select the patients for uh, the uh, mechanical thrombectomy or the thrombolysis. Um, but in the first six hours after onset of symptoms, uh, CT perfusion is not mandatory. So there will be differences between different practices. Uh, at our hospital, we do uh, CT perfusions in all acute stroke uh, patients uh, with symptoms up to 24 hours uh, because uh, CT perfusion can be helpful in the, in the first six hours in order to detect uh, the brain perfusion deficit and confirm the diagnosis of stroke, but it can also aid in the detection of vessel occlusion. So in our hospital, we do it in all patients coming in under the suspicion of a ischemic stroke up to 24 hours. Thank you for that. Just out of interest, Dr. Puge, do you, uh, what, what's the, your time frame for including perfusion at the front door for patients? Is it also up to 24 hours? You're on mute. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, 
this is very interesting because uh, probably could be a bit different uh, across different centers, but we, we perform C, um, perfusion, perfusion CT um, in all cases uh, of um, in, in the first 24 hours and probably beyond this, this time. Uh, we are flexible uh, in order to extend the, if we, if we see in a slight hypointensity, not just boring, just slight hypointensity and the patient, for instance, is a, a wake up stroke or, a, or a unclear on some time that you have to put attention to this kind of patients because probably we are seeing 20 or 30 percent of them. So we, we include the CT perfusion, uh, including over the, the 24 hours. And if we detect, if we detect um, penumbra, uh, our neurointerventionals, interventionalists um, go for, for thrombus. But always in, in all cases, in all cases between the, the, the 24 hours uh, okay. aligned with, with uh, diffuse and, and down. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting because when you start talking about beyond 24 hours, you start to wonder where the where the limit might be, don't you? Which is which is maybe where we're heading in the future. I have another question that's possibly for you, Dr. Puge, as well. And it's about how Bayesian CT perfusion might correlate with MR diffusion weighted imaging. Yeah, we we studied this uh, several years ago, and we we determined um, to, to conduct a strict, a strict study to demonstrate if there are difference among the two um, imaging modalities, CT and, and MRI, in terms of perfusion, it represents to have very close, um, very close in time the, the, the both uh, imaging modalities. So this is, this is a bit complicated in a hyperacute uh, scenario, uh, including now, nowadays that we have the, the, the thrombectomy. So we try to study around 80, 80 patients with a main difference of half hour between the CT and, and MRI. And we did not detect any, any um, we detect difference, we detect difference in the quantification of the volumes, but we did not detect difference in to treat or not, or not to treat the patient. Yeah. The, the quantification could be different. It is, it is very similar. It is very similar among the different uh, CT platforms so the, of software that we have to analyze the perfusion. The quantifications could vary, but the decision, it means if the penumbra is present or not, um, did not modify uh, studying the patient uh, using CT or, or MRI perfusion. Yeah, I think, and I see Dr. Meyer nodding as when I'm nodding too. I think that's always the principle, isn't it? If, if imaging can add value, then great. But, it, you know, it, it, if it doesn't change what we do, then there isn't maybe a, an argument for doing it. Because there's another question here that's saying, do you always recommend doing MRI and DTI in all stroke patients, even if CT has already confirmed what we needed to know? And I think that gets to the heart of this problem which is that if we've answered the questions we need, if the patient is eligible for a certain treatment on the basic of, basis of very simple imaging, that may be all we need to do. We can get on with doing the treatment and not be delaying things. Um, because even up to, you know, arguably at extended time periods, um, that if there is penumbra visible, it may not last forever. So we're still under some pressure to re respond quickly, I would argue. I wonder if any of the other panelists have strong feelings. Yeah. Um, what I would like to add to the discussion, because uh, there's a lot of discussion, uh, CT perfusion versus uh, MR diffusion. In my opinion, uh, we should not exaggerate this discussion because we should, um, uh, 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 yeah, we know the strengths of CT perfusion and the limitations, and we know the strengths of the diffusion, MR diffusion, but also the limitations of MR uh, regarding MR safety, for example, or the time to, to transfer the patient to the MR unit. So rather than, than have a, uh, um, how do you, uh, a debate which is better, we should just address the strengths and the limitations of both techniques. And uh, I think um, that, that, that is the same as you said, uh, if we do not uh, need any other information for treating the patient, we should treat the patient. If we are still having some additional questions, uh, we do not see a perfusion deficit, 
but the patient still has a suspicion of a stroke, but we are uncertain, then you can go for the MR diffusion in order to, to prove that the patient has a lacunar infarct, for example, because lacunar infarcts are easily missed on CT perfusion. Uh, so we should more uh, address it from that point of view. Yeah, I agree with that. And in fact, you've, you've actually just answered another question, which was someone was looking for us to compare CT and MR perfusion. But I agree with you. It really depends on how a centre is set up. Some centres are set up to do MR imaging as the first line, in which case they're going to do MR per, uh, perfusion imaging rather than CT perfusion, perfusion imaging. Um, but many, most centres probably are using CT. Um, let's see what else do we have. We are, we are running out of time, but we can maybe go on for a few more minutes. Um, and there's a question here regarding the use of DTI for in clinics, whether it needs advanced sequences and training. Um, I certainly am aware that processing some uh, DTI data sets do require certain software. It may not be available everywhere, but uh, Dr. Pugh, do you have um, other kind of simple ways to do this open source uh, software, for example? Is there, what, what do you do? Yes, this is very, this is a, a tricky uh, question because, uh, in fact, um, DTI could be analyzed with dozens and dozens of the programs. Um, we can do a specific analysis using SPM, FSL, or um, very complex uh, programs. We are clinicians, we are radiologists, we are clinicians, and we see a real patients, and we don't have time to decide um, in many occasions um, and, and we, don't have, we don't have expertise in the engineering in the, in the, in the in most of the cases. And the other issue is, is the time consuming that, that we, can, we can do this kind of process. So what I recommend is just uh, draw the, 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 the white matter track, mainly, I insist mainly the, the CST, um, using two arrays. The, in the upper region uh, close to the cortex. And for instance, in the, in the stem, uh, the, 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 the second, the second uh, ROI, um, try to, to depict the, the corticospinal tract and to fuse, to, to merge the diffusion in order to see the, the relation with, uh, with, with the ischemic lesion and determine if the corticospinal tract is, is uh, um, embedded or is into the, into the lesion. Because other approaches, other approaches are complex. Uh, if you are doing research, um, we, can, we can try to study the misotropy better. But for the clinical scenario, uh, the, main, the main issue is to see if the fever tract is involved or not by the lesion. This is my, my recommendation. And you can, you can do this, uh, I think in this, uh, I'm working with Canon and working with uh, Philips, but probably Siemens and G, the other two big uh, partners in, in this kind of technology, more than sure that you can represent an easy tractogram when, when you are seeing for the first time the, the, the acquired uh, imaging when you have the, the patient inside the, the magnet. So th this is my recommendation. Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, another kind of, the, the other kind of knowledge about, about the initial properties, uh, there is a, a big knowledge uh, of, of the engineering. And probably you, you, can, you can have people in, uh, in your surrounding or in your team. But uh, for a clinical point of view, my, my opinion, is we do not need this kind of information. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. I'm just maybe gonna end on, on a question that was actually directed to you, Dr. Meyer, but again, I think all of us can probably contribute and it's whether we're using AI systems in our workflows, trying to identify given aspects, score, identify hemorrhage, identify uh, dense arteries. I can answer very simply and say that we are not, although we are involved in testing them. I, I wonder, Dr. Meyer, what, what your position is on, on those systems. Uh, we use uh, a system for automated LVO detection, hemorrhage detection, and uh, we are evaluating the software uh, during 2021. Um, uh, 
I think one thing to to recognize is that AI is uh, is going to change practice, uh, and I think in neuroradiology, stroke is one of the main subjects which, in which AI will definitely contribute. Um, uh, my personal experience is that uh, AI uh, still suffers from the problem of uh, generalization and overfitting. So when uh, the software is trained, uh, one uh, pitfall is that it is overfitted. So it's really designed and trained on a specific uh, study population. But if you want to generalize it to clinical practice, then you see that the, the claim of the diagnostic performance is, is lower than, uh, than claimed by the, by the vendors. And that is something which is really uh, known with AI systems being trained. But that is something uh, 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 in the early phase of clinical implementation we are uh, going to, uh, yeah, to, to see and to recognize. So don't, don't be surprised that the, that the uh, actual uh, uh, diagnostic performance is lower than what is claimed by the vendors. But this is a process wh where we go through. In the end, I think uh, in, in stroke imaging, uh, it will really add uh, uh, for, the, yeah, for improving the speed and the quality of the diagnosis, but it will not replace the radiologist. Uh, that, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, we're all nodding, in, and I think we all agree with that. And then similar experience, um, these systems, we need to understand how they work. And that's why I think radiologists are often quite keen to be involved in testing them, and I think that's the right approach. Um, and it remains to be seen exactly where they add value, doesn't it? I think things like processing and refining energy quality, certainly that's, that's going to be excellent. Um, you know, providing quantitative scores of abnormalities, things that humans are not good at, that's good. I mean, using them to recognize big blobs of very obvious hemorrhage on CT, that doesn't, that doesn't add much to our, to our day, does it? But uh, Dr. Pugh, do you have any final comments? I sh I'm aware that we're very short in time, but I have to be quick. Yeah, and in this in this respect, I, I agree with with both of you. Uh, this is a this is a complicated issue. Now we are trying to, to develop some some projects about um, artificial intelligence to detect uh, the aspects, but but we have uh, a huge number of technical problems to register the, the 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 image. And more than this, um, sometimes we see that inside the penumbra we can detect a positive aspect. So this is not a real aspect. Now we are trying to merge the perfusion maps into the city, into the, the non contrast city in order to improve the, 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 the correct uh, quantification. But this is complex and I'm, I'm full agree with Dr. Major that finally the, this, this approximation needs our, our uh, supervision and just is a, is a tool to help us know uh, or for people who are doing teleradiology or teleassistance could be a good, a good tool, but in a strong comprehensive centers, probably we will spend several years supervising these kind of images beyond the, the technology, no? Yeah. I agree. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think all that remains for me is to hand back the reins to our hosts, and I see Erin has appeared. Hello, Aaron. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Mayor. What a great session. Um, many thanks to all our speakers for all those excellent presentations, full of great insights. And also thank you for the really interesting discussion at the end. And I'd also like to give special thanks to you, Dr. Mayor, for moderating the session. Thank you very much for joining.